and welcome to the Lockdown Learning Podcast, a show designed to help all of us parents turned home educators as we navigate this unfamiliar terrain. I'm your host, Mark Gallivan, a parent and a staff member at a democratic school in Colorado, USA called Alpine Valley School. And I'm your other host, Kate Coleman. I'm a mother to three boys and a staff member at the first Sudbury School in the UK, East Kent Sudbury School. Today's episode of Lockdown Learning focuses on the slippery concept of learning gaps. With schools across the world closed to in-person learning, many parents are concerned that if our kids aren't being made to study the essential subjects, that they'll forget everything they need to know when schools start up again. Yeah, so-called learning gaps or learning slides are something that parents previously only discussed over the summertime, but right now they're a daily topic. We've talked quite a bit about the idea of self-directed learning in previous episodes and how parents can relax a little and allow children to lead the way with their education. But we wanted to speak to an expert about what's really happening when children learn at home. Our guest today is Harriet Patterson, PhD. And I don't mind telling you she's kind of a big deal. Dr. Patterson is a senior lecturer in early childhood at Liverpool Hope University. She's also the author of Rethinking Learning to Read and co-author of the book, How Children Learn at Home. You can find out more about Dr. Patterson, her books, and her work in the show notes for this episode. We were so excited to get the opportunity to speak to Dr. Patterson and to ask her expert advice on home education. She covered a lot of ground with us, from what home education looks like in different families to what is really going on when our children appear to be doing nothing at all. It's a great interview, and I really hope you'll get a lot out of it. Here's Dr. Patterson. I'm Harriet Patterson. Uh, We were a home educating family. We've got three children, and none of them went to school um, until they got to about 16, 17, when they went off to college and to sixth form variously. And that they're they're all grown up now and doing their own thing, including university, master's degrees, working, and so on. And I was I I really loved being at home with my children. I found it completely fascinating, and I wanted to find out more about learning, about education, about what was going on in their heads. And I um, met Alan Thomas, uh, who was researching home education at the time, and he and I hooked up. We did some research together. Um, We wrote a book called How Children Learn at Home. And I carried on from there. I wanted to do some research specifically about learning to read. So I researched that for my PhD and I've carried on researching issues around home education and to do with informal learning. And I'm now a senior lecturer at Liverpool Hope University, lecturing in early childhood. Is there a common approach to home education or is there a variety? Are there a variety of approaches? And I think one of the key things about understanding home education is that every family has its own way. I started off thinking uh, thinking of home education as a kind of continuum that ranged from the very formal to the completely informal. So at the very formal end, there'd be things like a timetable, subjects, curriculum, Uh, maybe learning goals, possibly testing or some kind of evaluation. So looking looking very similar to school uh, in in structure. And then that continuum would, that would be at one end of the continuum, and that continuum would carry on until you got to a completely informal approach where nothing that looked like schools happened and families uh, tended not to have any structure at all. And I had the idea that most home educating families could be placed somewhere along that continuum from the formal to the completely informal. And in a way, they can as a sort of a kind of a snapshot of what's going on at any given moment. So whilst I'd say that approaches can be really varied, there are also some things that I felt that most home educating families actually hold in common. And uh, I think they're very important things. The first one, flexibility. It came over with all the research that we've done with home education, it, it's come over that families, wherever they are on that continuum, are generally speaking, highly flexible. They're aware of different approaches and they're willing to change those approaches. So for example, in the reading research, if what families were doing wasn't working or their child wasn't happy or they weren't happy or there was, you know, you know they, they'd be very flexible and say, okay, you know, let's try something else. Let's do something different. 
And that worked at both ends of the continuum. So in a, in a more formal, structured family, if what they were doing wasn't working, they'd say, okay, let's try something else. And they'd move on and try something else. But equally, over in the, uh, at the unstructured end of the continuum, there were instances where families changed and became more formal, perhaps because their child said to them, I want to learn to read, can you help me? Or sometimes less specifically than that, a child would ask for assistance in doing a particular thing, and that would become a more kind of structured way of going about it for the family. So there was a lot of flexibility. There was also a lot of changeability, individuality, and uh, it turned out that families with more than one child, with multiple children, very often did different things with those children. Uh, there was so many times people would say, you know, there's not a one size fits all. Every child's different. Every child's an individual. So even in some of the reading research, you know, we had um, quite big families. One family had 12 children. It was never a case of, well, we, you know, we learned what to do with child one and two, and then we applied that method to the others. Most of the families were very insistent that every child got treated as an individual. And again, that could move the family, move the approach uh, along that continuum from formal to informal. Uh, another thing that I felt that families have in common was uh, children's agency and allowing children, giving children a lot of independence, a lot of autonomy over how they went about learning. Sometimes that meant that parents had decided that they wanted to be structured and they wanted to teach their child and then found that their child actually wasn't into that, uh, didn't want to do it. And families then would say, OK, you know, if, if the child's not interested, we'll go for something different. Sometimes it meant that children wanted to take a particular approach. They wanted to approach reading or learning or doing something in a particular way. And the family would uh, go along with that at the child's instigation. It didn't necessarily mean, though, that parents were just there sort of receiving instructions from children and doing whatever children wanted them to do. Because another thing that I felt that, that, that the families had in common were high levels of negotiation between parents and children. And sometimes it was the children who directed things, but also sometimes it was the adults as well who said, you know, I'm not happy doing this. I don't want to do that. I need it to, you know, I need it to be like this. I need whatever out of this situation. Sometimes that could be in terms of a little bit of structure because parents felt uncomfortable giving that up altogether. Sometimes it could be uh, a detail in the reading research. Sometimes parents said, I didn't want to read this particular book to her. There was one mother, um, her daughter wanted to read the Bratz books and the mum said, I'm not reading those. So there was a certain amount of negotiation from the parents' side as well as the children's side about how they wanted to do things. And that kind of negotiation very often led to situations of co-creating, co-creating learning situations or learning experiences and some of the parents actually described it as that and saying this isn't us teaching and him or her learning this is a cooperative venture we're just doing something together something else that I felt that that families approaches had in common was innovation and families were very good at innovating and coming up with their own ideas their own ways of going about things um, making up games making up strategies ideas activities uh, not necessarily goal-oriented ones, but ones that their children wanted to do, that they wanted to do, that they were going to enjoy together. So there was a lot of innovation going on. And another thing which I found almost all the families had in common was there was very little emphasis on time. Very few families put anything other than a very loose time scale on learning. Instead, they were much more inclined to talk about time as an individual thing, talk about readiness, talk about interest, talk about motivation. And there was a certain element of being aware of age-related milestones and the pressures that these could impose. But again, it was usually parents thinking about how to hold, how to hold that pressure off from their children so that their children didn't feel under pressure and had the space and the time to do what they wanted to do in the way that they wanted to do it rather than having a structure imposed on them from the outside about you are this old, therefore you ought to be doing whatever it is. So Alan Thomas and I started researching and writing together, uh, and that led to our book called How Children Learn at Home. And we were trying to get a bit more of a, a theoretical 
angle on what goes on in home education. You know, we, we kept meeting lots of people who were saying, this is amazing, it's fantastic, all these wonderful things happen. And we were trying to think, okay, how do we theorize those wonderful things? And we came up with the idea of a kind of informal curriculum. And basically by that, we sort of meant three things, really. Uh, first of all, the culture that surrounds children in their homes and their everyday lives and the everyday objects that they use and the everyday activities that they do just as being members of a family. And those things give children a whole heap of information, um, practice and skills, including what we think of as being the educational staples of, of literacy, of numeracy, of science, of technology in its many different forms. And, and in fact, you could you could go through the school subjects and sort of look at everyday activities like cooking or going to the shops or doing a bit of gardening or a DIY job or, you know, or even cleaning up, you know, doing your housework and sort of map those on to, to school disciplines. There's a lot going on in children's lives anyway as, as members of their families, in their day-to-day -day lives, in the things that they do uh, every day with their parents, with their siblings, with their friends. A lot of information flowing through their lives, a lot of opportunities to do things flowing through their lives. And kind of beyond those, beyond the immediacy of those, we saw that there was also uh, great opportunities to broaden those things out. And the, and the most obvious way, I suppose, that, that we tend to think of is questions. And we've got that sort of stereotypical four or five-year-old child who can't stop asking questions. And uh, that's a great opportunity to, to add on, to find out a little bit more about what you're doing and, and what's happening in the world around you. We also found that people would pick that up in other ways. So reading books, so uh, either the child reading books or the parent reading books to the child, having conversations with people outside the family, going to a museum, going to a park or uh, an art gallery or just out for a walk. There were lots of opportunities to kind of widen out the experiences of home and find out more about them. And we also found that going back to the point about children being agentic, we also found that children were very inventive in pursuing the things that interested them. And very often children would pick up on an interest that the parents didn't have and find a way to pursue that interest. So whatever it happened, I mean, it's, it's a, a, again, it's um it's a bit of a, a bit of a sort of social joke, isn't it? That uh, you need to get the eleven year old to sort out, you know, your smartphone or your computer or you know your latest piece of technology because the parents are pretty hopeless at doing it. And we found lots of examples of that kind of things where children had become experts in things because they were interested uh, and they had pursued that interest, and it didn't necessarily depend on parents putting in the knowledge or you know. Uh, putting in the structure that would enable them to carry on with that interest. And there were lots of ways that children did that. Reading, obviously, going on the internet, doing their own research, joining clubs, talking to their friends, experimenting by themselves, all sorts of things. And that kind of leads on to what we saw as being this, this second really important strand in the uh, informal curriculum. And that was the way that children engage with the world around them. because. We know that children have to be active in, in, in order to learn things. It's quite possible to have this, you know, this tremendous flow of information just going right past you uh, and children not engaging with it. Obviously, that can happen in school. We did have a, a, a really nice, it can happen in home education as well. We did have a really nice story about um, a, a boy whose mum took him to a castle and the tour guide said to him, are you interested in history, son? And he replied, no, but my mum is. So children chose what attracted them and they found their own ways of exploring it. And sometimes, uh, particularly maybe for older children, they were quite overt ways like reading, like going on the internet, uh, like finding a club or somebody else with the same interest. But even for very young children, we found lots of watching, lots of observing and listening going on. That might lead to questioning. It might lead to conversation. Lots of playing. When children got interested in something, they might play it by imitating it, um, imitating what they'd seen and maybe expanding on what they'd seen and going through that 
Uh, what does it feel like to do this thing, whatever it is that they're interested in? Um, or they'd be making up scenarios around it, um, playing out scenarios to see what happened in particular situations. And that, that could be that could be just across a whole range of things, you know, from pretending to drive the car, you know, um, right the way through to complicated stories, practicing. We found a lot of practice goes on, only children tended not to see it as practice. They tended to see it as doing the activity for the sake of doing the activity rather than doing the activity in order to practice it, in order to get better at it. Um, and very often, some, um, very often people would say to us or parents would say to us, you know, that children would spend a lot of time just going over the same thing over and over again because they really enjoyed doing it. Uh, thinking. And th I think thinking is a really interesting one because obviously a lot of learning does rely on what goes on cognitively inside your head and the way that you think about it. But we tend to gloss over that a little bit in education because it's not visible. And we like things to be visible. Um, we want children to talk about things or to write things down uh, so that we can see them. And uh, I mean, the, the reading is a really good example because we want children to read aloud. We want them to read aloud so that we can, so that we can see what they're doing. We can hear what they're doing. We can see if they're getting it right or getting it wrong. Um, and thinking that doesn't have some kind of uh, outward manifestation like that, we tend to gloss over. But we found lots of examples of children doing quite deep thinking about things, building hypotheses, trying out ideas, working things out for themselves through a thinking process. And the other thing that we found was children doing nothing, apparently doing nothing. And over and over again, we heard stories of children who apparently did nothing. And parents sometimes describe this as, as a kind of process of osmosis, or they used metaphors about sponges, because it seemed that children were just absorbing things from the world around them. So children very actively engaged, actively engaged in all of those different ways in the activities, the things, that kind of stuff of the informal curriculum. And thirdly, we thought about what parents do and the interaction within families. And the thing about what parents did was that didn't really need to be pedagogical at all, didn't need to be taking on the role of a teacher at all. It tended to be more simply doing the things that we think good parents do anyway. So uh, talking to their children, taking an interest, playing with them, sharing their knowledge or their skills, uh, and having that kind of shared interaction, uh, much rather than a pedagogical role. The other thing that parents seemed to do very consistently was to view their children as being capable, which didn't necessarily mean that they were boastful or overestimated their children or made predictions about what their children were going to do. But it did mean that they assumed that if their child wanted to do something, that would be perfectly feasible. And there was that kind of kind of personal backup that we noticed as being the way that families saw their children. Right now, we've got a lot of children who would normally be in school at home instead and having um, perhaps the only taste of home education that they're going to have in their lives. And uh, obviously... This is this is a, a a huge change. I mean, not even with the context that we have at the moment, which is obviously you know this this big uncertainty around uh, coronavirus and all the stress that's associated with that. We've also got that this move of children you know, um, from a com from uh, completely different the things that have structured their lives, going to school every day, um, and a huge change to staying at home uh, with their parents. And what we find very often is that when children come out of school to be home educated, there has to be a, a kind of transition period. Sometimes we refer to it as de-schooling um, because it can be tremendously difficult to, even where families are embracing home education and the decision has been taken as a positive decision that the child's no longer going to be educated inside school, it can still be very difficult because your whole life has been organized and the family's life has been organized around the structure of schooling. And when that disappears, it can be really hard to pick up the threads again. And that, that's a common feeling with other 
big changes to, to lifestyle as well. So you know, when you first go to university and you have all that apparently free time and you have to structure your own study in it, uh, lots of students take a term, maybe longer, two terms. So some of them a whole year or, or even longer than that to, to find their way through that. Or when people retire and suddenly find that that enormous structure of getting up and going to work every day it's no longer there. So it's a huge life change. And really, we've only had that change for a couple of weeks. And, and as well, you know, obviously, the added stress of what's brought about that situation. So when children come out of school like that, if, if they ask for advice, then um, very often we say, you know, just take this, just take this period to relax. Don't try and do too much. Don't try and achieve too much. Just find your feet in the new situation. So, and I think that's very important that people take the pressure off themselves to do lots and lots and to keep pace with school and to achieve and so on. Um, So take that pressure off. What can you do to make the most of the experience? I think take the opportunities that the lockdown actually offers to be with children, to enjoy their company. Maybe see if you can take up a new interest together, something to do together or revive an old one. Maybe there's something that you've been waiting to do, but the weekends are never long enough and the holidays go so fast that maybe with a bit more time on your side now you could do together. And I'd also say um, be led by your children. See what it is that they're interested in. See, uh, see what it is that they would like to do with you. Alongside that, I'd say impose as little as possible. So I've seen some I've seen some photographs on uh, on on Twitter and on different sites on the internet uh, about how difficult it is to get children to sit down at the kitchen table to get the school books out you know, and and to start concentrating and pictures of children in dens uh, made out of blankets and furniture or children in the garden saying this isn't working look at, you know this is the evidence that that homeschool is not working. And I'd take that pressure right off and say, actually, you know, if you want to make a den and go into the den and read a book, that's great. If you want to lie on the floor uh, or if you don't want to get dressed, if you want to stay in your pajamas till lunchtime, it doesn't matter. You know, we can embrace those things as a, a little bit of freedom that the lockdown actually brings with it. So I think it's better to embrace that rather than to sort of try and fight for that structure um, that characterizes uh, our, our normal everyday lives and the other thing I'd say about making the most of the experience is is simply not into, to get into conflict uh, I know it's hard if there's schoolwork that needs to be done but if the only way to get it done is through an argument then it's unlikely to be done well um, and it's unlikely to be to be worth the argument to get it done so I, I tend to look at it a bit more positively and think right what is it that they might learn from this whole experience from being at home, from having some extra time on their hands, from having extra time with their parents or with their siblings? What is it that they might gain from that? What is it that they might learn from this whole experience about what do you do when you're challenged with something? You know, what do you do? Who do you rely on? What, what can you do for yourself? Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in uh, the flexibility, the creativity, the resilience, the robustness, um, the determination, the innovation of, of of people in general, but of children, because we, you know we're talking about children's education, and I think those are the things that we need to concentrate on in this situation, uh, and not worry about you know um, are they a week behind or you know have they forgotten this particular detail or point. I think it's much more important to focus on the bigger picture. So. If sort of go back to the things that characterize the home educating families, negotiation, see what you can ne- negotiate. Try and get co-creative with them if they're not, if they if they've got schoolwork to, to do and they're not particularly enjoying it, or if you feel that they really ought to be doing some reading or they really ought to be doing some sums, then see if you can do it alongside them, co-create a way with them for making that interesting or appealing or uh, or relevant to them in some other way. But ultimately, I think good relations are much more important. And you can always come back to the reading and the sums later on. We tend to think that 
learning is something that's consistent and ongoing, a continuous upward mo- movement. And I always think of, of, about the learning curve, about that that nice nice even curve of our imagination uh and actually when i was doing the reading research i really started to take issue with that idea that learning is on that kind of paced and constant trajectory and uh started looking at the experiences of children learning to read at home and finding that actually when you when you tried to put that down as a trajectory on paper they very often looked very very different um very often children decided that they would take a break from something and then come back to it later, or they began in a different place uh, and their learning didn't follow a particularly smooth trajectory, that it didn't seem to follow a trajectory at all. And uh, one of the parents described learning as a kind of complicated dance in which you do go backwards and forwards and sideways, and that we can perhaps through the lockdown, we can embrace that as being a natural and a normal way uh, for children and for all of us to learn, rather than thinking we have to keep making continuous progress on a pre-given trajectory. That does it for this episode of the Lockdown Learning Podcast. We would love to hear your feedback, as well as any other suggestions you have for future episodes. You can contact the show via email at lockdownlearningpodcast at gmail.com. I hope you found this episode educational and reassuring. Don't forget you can subscribe to the show on your podcast app of choice. That way you won't miss a single episode. In our next episode, we sit down with two teachers turned home educators to get their perspectives on the key differences between educating children at home versus instruction in a classroom setting. Look for that episode coming soon. In the meantime, if you'd like to find out more about self-directed education, you can find a lot of great information on our school's websites. East Kent Sudbury School is online at eksss.org.uk, and Alpine Valley School is online at alpinevalleyschool.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Kate. You've been listening to the Lockdown Learning Podcast. Until next time, remember to take a deep breath. Hug your kids and pat yourself on the back because we know you absolutely deserve it. Be well.